Thank you for uh, for having me. First off, um, I will say um, when you when you're you're knee deep in your careers, I've been now in this business for almost 20 years. You always look for things to learn from from uh, people that you work for. And um, with Joe, I, I had the privilege and blessing to work for him. And and I like two things really stood out for me. Is one is you can leverage sports entertainment to make the world a better place. And that's one thing that Joe was the first one that kind of gave me my awakening that the world can be better through sports. And uh, Joe is a, a prime example of that. And the second one is like just the, the raw planning and discipline um, of business that you have to apply to sports, which at that time in uh, 94 when I was hired, it just didn't exist. I and mean, it was just, they were just mom and pop um, dry cleaners, essentially. And um, and it was a it was just a privilege to get a foundation early in my career with one of the one of the great human beings I've been around and an incredible executive so so thank you very humbling intro on your part <laughs> so uh, I'll talk about whatever you want to talk about I'm I'm, uh, I'm pretty easy so um, I can tell you a little bit about my career I can tell you about what we're doing now I can tell you when the Sixers are going to win a championship whatever you want to talk about I'm good. So, um, so I, I know this isn't what you had planned, but um, any, anything you want me to talk about, before I can just kind of, I can I can talk forever. Yeah, give us what, how you got. Sure, how I got the story of how I got to here. Sure. So, um, <laughs> so I, um, I, uh, I, you know, I graduated from Villanova in '92, um, and. Um, I, I was a kind of a, a little bit of a, of a nerdy student. Like I, I didn't miss class. I sat in the front, I raised my hand all the time. I loved class. I loved learning. I did pretty well in school, um, and I volunteered for everything. I was involved. Kind of, I was like one of those kids that you're like, no, I was, I was that kid. <laughs> and um, I and graduated without a job. Uh, it was uh, '92, like I said. So we were in the, the throes of a, of a slight recession. So um, which I wasn't aware of at school. I had no, no idea even what that meant. Uh, most of my friends were going off and had jobs. A couple were going to get their PhDs. A couple it was kind of the accounting throws here, a big accounting school. So um, a bunch of the kids were off the Arthur, An the former Arthur Anderson, one at EMY. Um, so it was a bunch of those kind of guys. So we all went to the shore for the summer, and I was the only one that was out of work. And um, and I I uh, was a bar t a bouncer at the Princeton. You ever been to the Princeton? <laughs> Yeah, and I, you know, I had my friends were outside like as checkers, and I used to always make fun of them. I was actually right above the dance floor, which was a perfect prime spot. I didn't like to mix it up, you know, I'm more of a lover, not a fighter. So, but I could identify a problem because I was always that guy. So I could pick him out a mile away. I'd call one of the big guys. I'm like, the kid in the plaid shirt, he's got to go. Um, so, um, so I, I spent the summer playing basketball. I played twice a day, uh, went to the beach, and then went to work or went out. So it was, a, it was quite a life. And then um, my mom had sent me on this interview, and my mom and dad are, were consultants for ADP and McDonald's and Texaco and Xerox and a, a bunch of other big, big companies around the world. And um, they couldn't believe I didn't have a job because I was always a bit of a type A. So I was always kind of planning ahead and always kind of pushing ahead. And so um, my mom would call, and she said, so, you know, how's it going? I'm like, it's awesome. It's great. I'm having a great time. She's like, well, what are you going to do? You know, and I was like, I, you know, I don't know. You know, you mean tonight? She said, no, no, not tonight. <laughs> She said, look, I set up an interview. I was like, Mom, I don't want to go work for payroll services. She's like, look, this guy runs the region, the Pennsylvania region. He's my dear friend. I told him to interview you. I said, all right, yeah, when is it? Blah, blah, blah. So I, I, get, I had an old car. So I, I get my car. I'm driving back on the AC Expressway, and my car breaks down. And um, this is the night before. So I get out of my car. I hitchhike back. You know, I'm in college. So some stranger picked me up, drive me back, and I ended up getting like two rides. Ended up at my friend's house, who was a fifth-year senior, and um, so he was staying for the summer to get classes done and, and do his thing. And um, he's a bigger guy. I mean, he's a big, bigger guy than I am. So I had forgotten my clothes in the car. So I had my interview the first thing in the morning, and so I borrowed his clothes. So I looked like a circus clown. I mean, he had like <laughs> big feet and the you know jacked-up belt, like looped around and. Shirt looked ridiculous. It was honestly, it couldn't have gotten any worse. And um, and then he had one of those Suzuki Samurais. You all look too young to know what that is, but it's like this little tiny little Jeep with no top or no sides. So I took that over to his, his, um, the interview. I show up there. I, my hair is kind of gelled now, but if I don't, my hair gets like this big in the wind. And so I had a big like fro, and my clothes look ridiculous. And I walk in there, and I'm giving my pitch, 
and the guy's like, y you, you don't want to work here, do you? I was like, no, nah, I don't. <laughs> and um, so anyway, he's like, look, and he's like, if you're serious about finding a job and having a career, like, then be serious. I was like, are you kidding me? He's like, are you kidding me? I said, I hitchhiked 100 miles to get here. I got to sleep on the couch in my friend's place. I'm borrowing his clothes. He's like, yeah, yeah. You know, we're serious. It's a serious company here. You want to be serious? Get serious. Like, anybody that's going to come work for me would have been at Nordstrom's at 9 in the morning and bought all new clothes and showed up here looking fine, and you didn't. And it's like, you have to decide when you're going to get serious in life. And when you do, give me a call. I'd love to have you. You seem like you're a sharp kid, but this is not going to work here. So that was my intro to corporate America. Um, so I went home. My mom's like hysterical crying. I'm like, I don't need this. So I went back to the shore for a week, and I just went home. That was it for me. That was it. I just packed it in. I couldn't, I, I couldn't get it together. And I went home. My dad gave me the greatest advice that anyone's ever given me. He said, um, um, he said, look, I want you to write down 20 places you want to work. I was like, like anywhere? He's like, yeah. It's, well, like what, where do you want to work? I'm like, you mean anywhere? Like, I can write anything down, and you'll take this. He's like, yeah, write it down. So I, I took a day and came back down. I was like, all right, well, here it is. He's like, all right, well, who do you know at these places? I'm like, I am 22 years old. I don't know anyone. Like, no, no, you have to know someone who can get you to someone who can get you to someone. That's just how it works. So I'm like, Dad, I, I don't. He's like, go through the exercise. Just, just go through the exercise. It can be, you know, four people removed, but you got to find somebody. And, and sure enough, like, all but one. I could find a connection. It would be like a season ticket holder at a, at a team or a guy interned for his dad worked at the Olympics. So I was kind of like networking all over the place to see if I could draw my own tree. Um, and, um, and then I, I sent off resumes. This is like pre-internet. I know I look young. Don't say it. It's awkward. Um, and um, then I got a call from the Nets and I got hired as a marketing assistant. So I started essentially as a secretary, like a assistant, administrative assistant, <coughs> and wasn't a very good one. But um, I, I literally picked up dry cleaning, got lunch, got autographs from my boss, which was just brutally painful. Um, and, uh, and I fell in love with the business. I just literally fell in love. I was there, first one there. I worked seven days a week, and I was making 15 grand, no overtime, no health benefits, um, and uh, no vacation, which was awesome. Um, and I just worked all the time. I loved it. I was living in Hoboken, New Jersey, which is a good, fun, young town, if you've, you've ever been there. Um, I remember there were seven of us in this little three-bedroom. We used to rotate uh, per month who had to sleep on the couch. It was, it was uh, slim living, as they say. Um, and I've got a whole bunch of anecdotal stories of how to live with no money, but, but uh, it, was, uh, it was pretty gritty. That being said, I, I could not get enough of it. I, I volunteered for everything I could get my hands on, I did. And um, I remember one day, it was a Saturday or Sunday, I was in the office and I was fixing the copiers on my hands and knees, had my sleeves rolled up, and I'm down there fixing the copier. And um, the, new, the new president, this guy named John Spolster, whose son now is the coach of the Heat, um, Eric, he's a friend also. Um, but John had just come in as kind of the savior president. And he's just like, what are you doing? I was like, uh, fixing the copier. He's like, why are you fixing the copier? I'm like, because it's broken. <laughs> and uh, he's like, all right, listen, um, what, what is your name again, kid? I'm like, it's uh, Scott O'Neill. He's like, what do you do here? I, you're here all the time. You know? And so it's essentially him, who's the president, the general counsel, the CFO, and me. And I was there literally whenever. I was like, you guys need anything? <laughs> you know? um, and so I, you know, it's amazing. Um, hard work can make up for a lot. Um, and I, I didn't have much. I didn't know anything. Um, so I... I uh, kind of stumbled my way into uh, my first promotion. which So he called me in his office that day. He's like, what do you want to do? I was like, I want to sell sponsorships. He's like, congratulations, you've just been promoted. So that was my first promotion, eight months in. And he's like, you can have that office over there? I was like, are you serious? When do I start? He's like, today. I'm like, I can start today in that office. He's like, do you want to know what you're going to make? I'm like, I don't really care. <laughs> so, uh, and then I, I failed for a couple years just in terms of just I was sales, you know, I was in sales selling sponsorships. Uh, most of the young people start out in our business and selling tickets. And you know, I, I'd been doing some uh, some stuff at night for the sponsorship guys, just preparing decks and stuff to get a sense of what they do and how they do it. And uh, it looked more fun. So, um, and I just was making 200 calls a day then for a couple of years. And um, and you amazing like to entertain yourself to make 200 calls a day. What you have to do to actually entertain yourself and enjoy it, which I did. So I had all these different games for myself. So. 
Um, I ended up um, getting in front of Joe. Um, a friend of mine was at a cocktail party with Jeff Lurie, um, who had just bought the team, um, and a friend of Joe's, a longtime friend of Joe's from growing up. And um, he's like, look, they're looking to bring an NBA mentality. The NBA always seems to be a bit, a, a bit ahead of most of the other leagues in terms of how they operate their teams. Just a little like more aggressively staffed, because we had to be a little more creative on a marketing standpoint. Um, and so he, he was looking for that kind of mentality. So then I, I, I just cold called them, and then I ended up with Joe, and I got a job, which was great. So I was hired as director of sales. I was young. I was 24, which was way too young for that job. Got you, Joe. <laughs> and, um, and I learned really quickly. Um, I, I, got to, I got to do some deals, um, and then Joe hired um, my next boss, Len Komorowski, who's now the CEO of the Cavaliers. So if you look at my career overall, I mean, I, I, I kind of fell upwards and I've worked for the, such incredible people. I mean, Joe at the time wasn't um, the Joe Banner that you know now. He was, uh, you know, they were trying to figure it out. I think he was like head of business administration or something. I used to, I can't remember what you started at, but quickly he was like running the team. And so here, you know, then you work for Len Komorowski, he ends up being the CEO of the Cavaliers. So I, I, I got this incredible opportunity to learn from these amazing people um, throughout. And then I uh, went to HBS, which was incredible experience. Uh, just a quick story there. I, by the way, I, I, it was like on my list. If you keep a list, I, I keep a list of all the stuff I don't anymore. I'm, I'm, I've been vowed to redo it. But I would always keep a list of stuff I wanted to accomplish in my life. Um, and I started it when I was 16 or so. And on that list, when I was 17, I wrote, I want to go to Harvard Business School. And, and a kid coming from where I came from, um, and, and it's just not the path. I, you know, there was no path. Like the kids that go to Harvard Business School go to Choate. Or they go to you know Exeter, and then they go to Princeton, and then they go work at McKinsey, and then they go to HBS. That's just kind of the the, the way you do it. Um, you know, it wasn't um, selling popcorn at the vet, as I used to tell people I did for a living when I got there. Um, my first day there it was a pretty amazing place. Like I, I sit down, I'm already thinking like, what am I doing here? And I sit down between these two people, and um, this I turn to this one uh, woman who ended up being in my section. And, was talking to her about what she was doing. She's like, yeah. I said, well, and that was the standard question at school. It was like, what did you, what'd you do you know, before you got here? She said, you know, I was helping um, restructure the Russian economy. I'm like. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I seriously, I would tell people, I, I was like, oh, I was like a popcorn vendor. It's like, it's a bigger job than you think. And I would go through the thing, <laughs> deadpan the whole time. So I just couldn't get away from her fast enough. She ended up being a good friend. Couldn't get away from her fast enough. So I turned to this other guy, um, his name's Max. I couldn't hear a really thick accent. A third of the kids, um, uh, students that were there, um, had English as a second language. So until you got the cadence of the different accents, it was, it was very difficult for me. And once I got the cadence, I was fine. And I honestly could not understand what he was saying. And it ended up his father was the king of Liechtenstein. <laughs> ah, he's like in the family business. So uh, yeah, I'm like, that's just like my family business. So, uh, but I ended up having a wonderful experience there. I learned a ton. Um, got to challenge myself and, and found out that, you know, just like anywhere else and, and then wherever any class you're in, you know, that you're going to be really good at something and there are other people that are going to be really good at stuff and, and you learn to kind of lean on each other for the, for the, uh, for the, for the subjects and topics that you're not good at. But, but what, I, what I learned there was just you, you just have to raise the bar in terms of what your ceiling is. And sometimes, um, again, I talk about, um, you know, I, I, I didn't grow up, I grew up in a very parochial environment and it's just, you know, and then and HBS just just lifted up the ceiling and said, okay, I can do anything, you know? Um, and it was pretty amazing to be around such incredible people and dreamers. And I ended up giving the, uh, I was selected by my, by my classmates to deliver the uh, graduation speech, which was like one of my biggest honors. It was pretty amazing. Um, and mostly because I didn't care about the jobs they wanted to have. I, you know, I wished them the best. Um, and then I failed at a startup once I left the Eagles for the second time. Um, and I let, found myself out of work, out of luck, and out of money. I don't recommend it. People say, like, to be a success, you have to fail. I do not subscribe to that. Um, I, I, uh, I got married very young at 25. Um, and um, I met Lisa. She was an intern at the Nets when I was an assistant. It was like pre-Lewinsky. It was kind of OK back then. And um, it's true. Thank you. I really worked. I worked in a rehearsal, too. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, when, when we had our first, I have three daughters, um, 15, Alexa's 15, and Kira's 12, and Eliza turns nine uh, next week. And uh, my oldest was um, one, almost one, started walking. And um, 
so Lisa had retired. She was in sports too. That's you know. Um, but when she had her baby, she stopped working. Our first baby, and um, and so like, look, you're out of. I mean, I just lost all my money. I had no job, <laughs> like credit card bills, like mortgage. I mean, it's 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 like it's, you know. The second time, when I when I was fired at the Garden, which I'll tell you about, then I had money. I got like two years severance. I'm like, I'm going to Cabo. Totally different. Um, so to be at, at, like, have some pressure on you and not be like mentally uh, together, to be able to pull together to go out and find a job is, is not an experience I, I would wish on anybody. Um, but, um, but I went through that. I ended up getting hired at the NBA. Um, to be part of this incredible group called um, the Team Marketing and Business Operations, Team Bo, as it's known in the industry. And that was a group that built best practices for the NBA teams, WNBA teams, and the D-League teams. And uh, I got to work for Commissioner Stern, who is a brilliant, brilliant man, the meanest man I've ever been around, but brilliant guy, brilliant thinker. And Adam Silver, the, the current commissioner, ended up being my boss uh, for quite some time. Uh, but before that, it was Bernie Mullen who went on to run the um, – the uh, Hawks and Thrashers. So it's kind of, uh, kind of, um, it's pretty fun. Um, I, I will tell you, like, I never learned so fast, so much, so fast in my life than, than being at the NBA and being able to travel to fifty some odd teams and just ask questions about the business uh, philosophy, how you build an organization, all that. That stuff was was amazing. And I ended up running the group and running some other stuff there. Um, I became kind of my reputation became um, as one that could build a bridge between teams and league because there's oftentimes a lot of friction between the two. And, um, and so I, I had some success there in terms of understanding like the dynamic of the NBA, which is a, a pretty uh, notoriously difficult place to work, um, difficult place to break through. And I, I just, I, I loved my job. I love the people still. I love the place. I love the brand. I had a ball there. Uh, traveled a ton. I met a ton of people, traveled the world. It's amazing. And I got to travel with uh, the former commissioner and the current commissioner quite a bit. Like, I, I mean, you know, you think about the opportunity to be around, you know, some of the heavyweights in the world and, and to get that, that opportunity at a point where uh, David Stern was kind of at the, you know, on the back nine for him and he was in teaching mode and he was so mean that everybody was so afraid of him. Um, and I just wanted to learn. I'd, I'd, I'd take a beating to learn eight things. And, um, and so we'd get on this plane. I would sit right. I, we would walk on a plane. Everybody else would go to the back, and I would sit right across from them. And we would talk shop for four hours. I mean, it was incredible. Um, and so I had a ball there. And then I got to that point in my life, I, I wanted to run something. So um, I hit, when I got hired, uh, the commissioner had said, come work for me for three. Because I said, I want to go run a team. That's what I, I want to do. I've wanted to do this since I started at the Nets. I knew I wanted to do this. And um, he's like, come work for me for three years, then you go run a team. So eight years later, you know, I went in and said, hey, um, you know, I'm ready. I'm ready. And he's like, all right, you know, figured you'd come in sooner or later. And he's like, what do you want? I said, I want to turn around. I want a big brand. I want a big city. He's like, how about the Knicks? I'm like, that sounds good to me. So three weeks later, I get hired as president of Madison Square Garden. Um, and, uh, and that is a tough environment, but that is a wonderful brand. Big, big brand. I mean, you can't possibly describe it. I remember, if you know the name Dave Checkets, who's a, a longtime guy in the business, who's a good friend. Um, he called me when I took the job and he said, He's like, he said, uh, hey, congratulations. Oh, thanks, Dave. Um, you know, I know you had a falling out. <laughs> He's like, you'll have yours too. I'm like, no, 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 I won't. He's like, yeah, you will. And I, he, said, um, he said, you understand, like, this is, this is a big, big job. He's like, I'm not sure you understand the, the weight and gravity. I said, Dave, I grew up in New York. Like, I have a pretty good sense of what this is all about. He's like, Scott, this is bigger than the Yankees. It's bigger than you could possibly imagine. And he was right. Like, I had no idea how big the Ram was. Uh, we went through, it was in 2008 when I took the gig, um, right through the, obviously the, the whole world was collapsing. Um, and during that time, we spun the company off from, from Cablevision. Um, we took on a billion dollar project to, to transform Madison Square Garden into what it is today. And we did the biggest deals that had ever been done in the business. And it was a ball. Um, and then I got fired. It happens. Um, but I got a nice severance. So I did go to Cabo. And then I, I uh, actually, I was kind of jacked up. My head was jacked up then too. Um, getting fired, is, is, I, I don't mean to make light of it because I, I can now, but it's, it's, uh, it's pretty rough, um, especially in these kinds of jobs. You, you end up, you're in, the, you're in the media, you're in the paper, and they don't say very nice things about you. Um, and because uh, the place that fired you oftentimes like goes to take some shots off the record. So nobody's quoted, but, but it's not good when your kids are like reading about the stuff that you did that, you know, you did or didn't do. 
Um, so, and, and then all your friends are calling you. They don't know what to say. Is it okay? Are you okay? And they don't know how to talk to you. Um, and I'm like, no, nah, you know, it's, it's all fine. And then, you know, so I, I had a tough time at the beginning. But I did take my wife to Cabo for 10 days. I, I left my phone um, in, the, in the, it never came out of the room. It was like, it was liberating. I read like seven books. We stayed at Las Ventanas if you ever want to spend way too much money on a vacation, but have complete paradise, that's it. Um, and I just got my, I got my sense of self back. I was up every morning watching the sunrise. Um, and I, I just, it was great. And then I came home and I always wanted to take my girls to Europe. And so I took them all over to uh, Paris and, and London. I took them out of school. I got truancy notices. This public school system is broken in America. <laughs> I was like, and, I, and of course, like I'm sending sarcastic emails back. And my wife's like, why? I am going to have to clean up this mess. Just stop. I'm like, will they learn more in Paris or in kindergarten in your school? Um, <laughs> so it's unbelievable. Honestly, honestly, it's unbelievable. Um, and then I came back and um, and I, you know, I was playing hoop every day. That's my my escape. If you have an escape from the world, if you don't, you better find one. Well, some people like to read. Some people go to movies. Like I play basketball. So for me, I hear the bounce of the ball. Or coach, I coach my two little ones still. Um, and the, the bounce of the ball is so I just when I need to to go and escape I go play, and um, so I was playing basketball again every day and feeling healthy, and started to call my friends and then uh, and ended up with I was looking at a bunch of different things and then I got a call from from Josh Harris and Dave Blitzer, Dave I'd known socially in New York, and uh, Josh I tried to sell something to once before, and then they started talking to me and I, I was looking for for shared values so I, I got to a point in my my life my career I had a pretty good you know pretty good reputation and had done enough enough stuff and knew, knew a few people. And I just kept saying like, I want to be around people I love, like, and respect more than anything else. Um, I'm not sure I'd have gone to Milwaukee, um, but, um, but I, I might have. Like I, I honestly was just at a different phase. And, and these guys struck all the right chords. It was like sports entertainment is a vehicle that changed the world. You know, we have day jobs. They're, we're, they're my age, uh, they're very self-made guys, five kids each. Um, married to their wives, first wives, you know, they're, you know, good parents, um, good husbands, um, very self-made, and they just buy and empower you. They have, we actually have an expression at work, which is not very comforting or very exciting, depending on what your DNA is. But ours, they say to me, my first couple times, they're like, look, you're the CEO until you're not. Right, so in my business, what that means is like, go ahead, make the call, big shot, you know, and if it's wrong, <laughs> You'll be going back to Cabo, and that's okay. And because you take that bet every every day and twice on Sunday, and I, and, I, and I have, and it's been a ball. Oh, and then so I came down here, um, and then uh, two months later, my my neighbor in Connecticut called, and, and um, he asked if we wanted to buy the Devils, and I said yes. And then ten days later, after diligence, we bought the Devils, just like that. And my life turned got turned upside down. We're looking at a bunch of stuff now. Hopefully, a, an announcement soon. But yeah, fun fun group, fun people. Um, broken businesses, which I like, um, incredible brands, strong markets. So it has all the bones of something that could be really special. And uh, it's our job to, to build a team and make it that way. Joe? I, I weave quite a tale. <laughs> all right, so you guys, you know, you kind of heard this, you know, some about Scott. You know, our preference would be is to see if you guys have some questions for him. Has he said anything you want to ask him about? He's open to it. Or not? Yes, Matthew. Scott, can you talk to the group about um, how you deal with these high profile, whether they're in business or, or professional athletes? And then can you work into the um, kind of group of bond to email? Sure. I don't like to say that on, on tape, but I will. So every, it's just a little tip. Whenever you speak in front of a group, you have to have a plan in case there's not a question. And Matt, that's my plan. Thank you, Matt. <laughs> Um, sure. So, um, you know, I'm not very starstruck. Um, my wife would say it's cause I don't know who any of these people are, um, which is probably partially true. Um, I, um, I, I'm really comfortable around athletes, which is helpful. Um, and they're just kids. I mean, you know, when you get to the heart of it, I'm 45 and, um, and one, our player, um, Jaleel Okafor, was a kid from Duke who we, uh, who we drafted, like his dad is 40 years old, his father. 
So when you put it in perspective, um, you know, in terms of, you know, it was different when I was their age. I'm not. And I, I think that we as organizations have a lot of opportunity to help these um, players, um, these athletes, kind of grow up and be kind of contributing members of society, be nice, respectful men who, um, who save their money and do the right thing. And so that's an obligation we take really seriously. Um, and it's a lot of pressure in a lot of different ways. Um, I, I would say that the, um, the players coming into the league now are so different from when they were 20 years ago. They're amazing. They understand their brand. They've been coached and taught. They understand media. They understand kind of the business. It's so different. I mean, it, I mean, I can't tell you what a joy it is to work with the people coming into the league now. They know how to dress. You know, it's 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 easy, easy easier. Um, it's not even close. Um, and they're smart, savvy. This is a really, really, really good generation of young players on both the NBA and NHL side. Um, so, so we haven't had too much, too many issues um, on our end. And we have a bit of a no, uh, a no or low tolerance policy, which has been pretty effective. Um, I learned that when I got to New York. It was funny. We had um, a couple of players uh, who will remain, remain nameless because I have a microphone on. But we had one guy who was like, you know, he had done it all. I mean, like dog fighting, drugs, prostitution rings, everything. And when I got there, I had known from some files I had looked at. And I was like, whoa, how is this guy here? And he said, oh, it's just not, we don't, no. We don't do that here. I was like, well, what does that mean? It's like, no, no, no. Everybody plays it, you know. <laughs> I was like, what does that mean? It's like, no, no, no. When you come here, we tell you, like, this is what our expectation is, and you are going to act like this. This is New York. This is not how we act. And I was like, huh, and that works. It's amazing. You know, you set boundaries. You give expectations. You provide necessary feedback. You get help, counseling when necessary, and you treat the men like men, and, and they act like it. And it was, a, it was a really good lesson for me to see just kind of different – different systems and different ways uh, you get to be with around the athletes. Um, so that part's been been pretty intuitive and fun. And I, I think I've learned a pretty good, a few pretty good lessons. Um, in terms of the, the LeBron, I was on the team to, that was recruiting LeBron, and um, it's a pretty pretty wild story. Um, so I don't know if you want to hear it, but this. <laughs> so um, so we had we've been preparing for the that summer for uh, six months or so. And we had rented this incredible penthouse. Um, it's like the highest um, floor in Midtown. And it was like 25 grand a night. I mean, it's 360 view of the city. It's spectacular. And then three days before, the three big guys were like, yeah, we're not coming to New York. <laughs> Come to us. So the guys that worked for me threw the best Fourth of July party ever up here. I heard. I was on the road. But yeah, I heard it was pretty spectacular. Um, and then we went. We went to go see Joe Johnson first in L.A., um, and then uh, we all went to Cleveland. We were split up a couple different places. And it was a circus. It was like such an incredible moment in time, like just to be a fly on the wall and see us kind of, you know, zip down underneath the building and then just 200, you know, cameras outside, security, like crazy security, and walking into this room. And it was like no bigger than this little area. There are 10 people in there. And then, um, you know, us go through our thing. It was, should have gone to New York. I'm glad he didn't now, but. Um, all right, what else? Yes? What's your best answer for you know, the Philadelphia fan that um, perceives a conflict of interest between the Flyers and the Devils, between the Sixers and the Devils, because you know, Flyers compete with the Devils and mm -hmm. that sort of thing? Yeah, I mean, you know, the Comcast, who own, Comcast Spectacore, who's owned a majority by Comcast, I think they own 70% or so. Um, I mean, they're our partners. So it's like fans don't always see like what it, how it actually works, but – like, it's not like, I mean, look, when we were playing, like, we want to win, but we're all trying to help each other. I mean, that's just the way the, the life is cut. So, you know, John Page and Sean Tilger, guys that run the building and the, and the Flyers are, like, good friends. Like, we get together at least once a month for, for lunch or dinner. We help each other with, like, our business stuff. So, like, hey, have you booked this concert? You should call this guy. I mean, that's just how, how it works. So, um, so in terms of, like, the separate, I'm one of the few people that cross over both. Um, uh, you know, I got I got toasted a little bit with by the media early on, but fans kind of get the. I mean, I, you know, I'm a businessman, so um, I I don't know. There's there's not much like in if you peel back the onion, there's nothing there. So I, I think that's that's probably what what I would say. Um, I mean, I root against the Flyers. I'm three for four, as they say. Um, 
I, you know, I, I hope they do fine, just that we beat them and finish ahead of them in the standings every year. But I, I hope, you know, I, I root, the way, I mean, I, this is not going to make any sense to anybody in here who's, who's a fan of sports. But, like, like, Villanova basketball is my only fandom left. That's it. Everything else is just, I just root for my friends. And so, you know, this would be heresy where I grew up, but, you know, one of my really good friends runs the Red Sox. So I root for the Sox because of him. Not, like, I, like, I don't have a rooting interest. I don't care if the Yankees win or the Phillies. I mean, I, you know. So it, it's a little bit different in terms of, like, when you get inside the business. And I know as a fan, like, I, if I were sitting in your chair, like, I never would have understood what I just said. Um, but it's amazing, you know, to, to grow up a fan of something and have somebody else, you go work for somebody else. And like, all of a sudden, like, like how could you change allegiances? Like, and, and I used to make a joke, well, they're paying me. It has nothing to do with that. Like you are, when you're in this organization, you live, eat, breathe, drink, sleep it. That's all you know. You get to know the athletes. You get to know the coaches. You get to know the GMs. You, you know their families. They know you. Everybody's kind of, band, like, kind of coming together for this common cause, this common like goal, it's just, it's, it, that's like what makes team sports so special. Um, and so the allegiances are a little bit like, a little difficult for, for fans to understand how we actually, or I actually say how I see the world. So for us, like I got, you know, I mean, I, you know, I flipped from um, Rangers to Devils, which is like, you know, forget about the Flyers, they hate each other. And it took me, you know, I, I, when I got fired, I took all my Ranger stuff, like, and I had, you know, you can imagine you work for a team, it's all, you get, you know, gear beyond belief. I took it off, I called two of my friends who were Rangers fans, I was just like, hey, if you're interested, I've got like $10,000 worth of stuff that you can have. And if you don't come today, I'm throwing it in the garbage. Um, um, it's a little more difficult for your family because they really get invested in the teams, especially when young kids, it's kind of, they grow up with the team and then you have to like, pull the rug out from them and you take the hat and you burn it that you bought them. <laughs> I didn't do that, but I thought about it actually maybe once or twice. Um, but that, that stuff can become tough. But, but the, the fandom part of it is, is, um, it's different when you work in the business. But, I mean, not better or worse, but just, just different. Yes? How was managing expectations when you're trying to turn around and bring a big brand like that, like with, with timetables and stuff like that? Sixers you're talking about? Just anyone that because you were the Knicks as well. So. Um, what ha at least for me, is like whenever I go into a place, you know, the plan is you do an assessment, you know, this is the plan before you actually get in there. I like to come in, I like to do an assessment, I'm going to act very quickly and very responsibly, I'm going to ask a lot of questions early on, then I'm going to make really quick, decisive decisions, then I'm going to set the time, like the agenda, get the management leadership team in place, and then we're going to go. It's kind of like how you, I'm thinking through it. And not always in my head, I think in six months, I'll have this thing covered. Every single time. This has been th three of them. And um, inevitably, it's, um, it's six months before you can breathe. It's a year before you start, you know, you, you fire people and start to pull your management team together. It's 18 months before you've been through a cycle, like one cycle of a season. So you, can't, you haven't really made a difference in that first cycle. So it's not until months like 18 to 36 that you start to see real difference in a turnaround. It doesn't mean you don't get pieces or you know you, you see parts of the business that are cooking, but until you're in that like that next cycle, you don't get to see the machine. Um, so so I'd say like it's a it's about a two year process till you start to see a machine that you're comfortable with and you say like okay this meets the expectations that I would have set forth if I had been smarter up front. Yes. What advice do you have for students who want to break into the Hmm. I would say um, I would get to know someone. It's helpful. I would figure out, um, I would just not assume that it's a straight line, like um, that it's a linear path. I think that the business is getting so big so fast. And you have to figure out like where you want to play in the business. And so, um, you know, I think, some, I think sometimes entering at a low level is not the most ideal way to do it unless that's what you want to be and that's what you want to do. I think sometimes if you get some expertise, so if, if you were in, um, if you were going to law school and you wanted to become an attorney, you know, I think it better to go to like Proskauer and then work on MLS and work on the Eagles and work on the NBA than it would be to go work for the Devils as like a staff attorney at whatever, 27 years old. 
I just, I, you know, and, and that's different for different roles. If you weren't um, going to be a lawyer and you wanted to go into, into business, I would say um, <coughs> same thing. I would have some, you know, some um, skill set. If you didn't, I would go sell. I would just, I would, I would gut it out and grit it out. Um, <coughs> I'd say in the last two years or so, not two years, last seven, eight years or so, the talent that's come in, it's real big talent. Like I've got, you know, on my small little team, I've got, you know, a couple um, HBS guys. I've got a couple Wharton MBAs. I've got Stanford MBA. I got some really like heavyweight intellectuals, and that's unthinkable, even five years ago, and in, in a small, in, you know, two small, relatively small businesses. So I think you're, you're starting to get some real intellectual capability and capacity in these teams, and so you've got to figure out like where you want to play and what you want to do. If that helps. All right. Yes. So the Sixers are obviously a rebuilding process right now, and you learned a little bit about your efforts to rebrand and point the direction that the direction. How do they do? How about the quotes? Most important thing. Good. Any photo or no? No photo. Uh, yeah, photo. Good. Um, <laughs> I'm just trying to help. So when you have a situation where, like with basketball, you know. Get like one important guy in the draft, or you're usually a big player, especially if you're drafting the top of the board. Um, with an injury like <coughs> Joel and Dee, where you have a huge setback like that, how do you handle that in a team that's already kind of struggling to get mm -hmm. really moving? Yeah, I, I mean, it always depends on your perspective. So, um, so I'll say my perspective is slightly different. So I'll, I'll tell you what mine is. So when I got here two years ago, Sam and I came in around the same time. Our team was Drew Holiday, who was the worst all-star on the Eastern Conference. Like, and I don't say that disparagingly. He was probably like the 12th guy on the, on the all-star roster. Still an all-star, good up-and-coming guy, but he was 23. You had um, Evan Turner, second round, second overall pick. Thad Young and Spencer Hawes. You had three first-round picks in the next five years and two second-round picks in the next five years. So that's what we had. And so in two years, we have... Nerlens Noel, Jalil Okafor, Rob Covington, Jeremy Grant, Nick Stauskas. Three of those guys are uh, top eight picks. You've got Joel Embiid, who we think is coming back healthy and happy in a year. We'll see. Rehab's going very well. We have Dario Saric, who's in Europe, who's the young Europe play, best play, young European player of the year, two years in a row. Um, only two other guys have won that award twice. Um, Val Shunis and uh, Rubio, two, two kids, if you know the game, uh, Minnesota and Toronto, good, really good players. He's a good player. Um, and we've got four number one picks this year, two of which will likely be high lotteries. We've got swap rights with SAC for the next two years, and we've got an unconditional SAC in 18. It's like, sign me up. You know, so when you say rebuilding, I'll say, yeah, rebuilding from what? You know, we had to tear down the first year. And then it's like, I, like, I wish we could snap our fingers and bring a championship contending team here. But we spend quite a bit of time studying franchises that have been successful for an extended period of time. If you look at San Antonio, if you look at Chicago, you look at Dallas, look at these organizations, you say, like, how did they do this? Um, you know, there are a couple examples you can point to where you've, you've found, like, creative uh, free agent moves. Um, very rarely. You can point to maybe Miami, but I think that was a moment in time. And without Dwayne Wade in Miami... Bosch and LeBron are not going to Miami. No chance. No chance. Um, and and you know, every, every other situation was anchored by, by draft, but through the draft. In fact, of the top 15 free agents this year, this summer, only two moved, Monroe and Aldridge. Two of the top 15. And by the way, they're both bigs, and we are stacked with bigs, young bigs. And we'll see which ones can play or not. Because they're, they're only kids. They're 19 years old, so we got to give them a break. Um, we think Embiid's an elite player. So I've seen him. He's the best big I've ever seen, and I hope he's healthy, and everybody will fall in love with him. And nobody will believe me, and that's okay. I've seen it. I've never seen – I cannot wait for him to get on the court. He had the same injury Ilgauskas had, just to address him. He was a player uh, – Cleveland retired his jersey last year, seven foot three Lithuanian guy. Um, he missed the first three years. So I hope, I hope Embiid's a year better. Um, Yao Ming had a very similar um, injury. Ilgauskas played 13 years. I think Yaming played nine. So would you sign up for Joel Embiid at his skill level to play 10 years right now? I would. He's a freak talent. 
So we, we, like, we, we like where we are, we like who we are, and we like where we're going. It doesn't come without pain and suffering. Um, that first year for me was just torture because I knew that we were just shuttling guys out of there. Um, and that was hard, uh, really hard. Really good guys, all nice guys, but not, not you know, we, we changed the style of play. And, uh, and we, we believe that you win in this league anchoring through the draft. And, um, you know, and you don't have to have the number one overall pick. And there are very few transformational generational players. They come by every like six, seven years. Uh, we hope to, to get one. Joe might be one, quite frankly, I hope. Um, and we'll have another shot or two this year. Um, Steph Curry was seventh pick overall. So it's, it's, you can get them, you know, but most of the real difference makers are, are in your top like seven, eight, nine-ish guys. And we'll have another couple shots this year. So I, I think like if you look at the job that Sam Hinkie's done, it's, it's pretty amazing. I mean, I, you know, the deal we did with Sacramento was one of the best deals I've seen. The, the deal with Drew Holiday to New Orleans where we picked up Nerlens, it actually turned into Nerlens. Um, Dario and a, and a first. I mean, it's, it's insane. So um, more to come in terms of what we can do, and and we got another. I think another adventure this year. I think you know, it's a really really young team. And as I I told my board, um, um, for those of you who are, I might be talking way too inside basketball, so I'll stop. But um, Kevin Durant, Westbrook, and Harden were on the same team and missed the playoffs. As young kids. Now these are three hall, surefire Hall of Famers, three of the best players in the league, three of the top ten players in the league right now, on the same team as kids, Mr. the playoffs. And I was like, I'm not sure I see any of those guys on this roster right now. So we have some investment to do, we have some development to do, and we're doing it, and it takes time. And and that message to this market has actually worked. Like since I've been here, our season ticket base is up 40 percent, our sponsorship base has more than doubled. So like the business community and the ticket buying community at least is buying, which is good. It's a good sign. Um, and we've got a long way to go to put a product on the court that we think is representative of the city. Um, I, I can tell you where we're putting a lot of that investment is in um, some of the, the, the nuances that will never show up, like health and wellness, sports science, uh, nutrition. It's amazing. Like when you're, if you think back um, when you're 19 years old, you think about what you ate and you think about like what, what the you know the DNAs of our bodies are just different. So what's good for me and will optimize my body performance is very different from probably what will optimize for yours. And so we're doing a lot to figure out, you know, water, sleep, everything. We, we measure and track just about everything you can think of to make sure that we're given our chance, you know, that two percent edge to see if we can uh, get better quicker. Great coach, great system, it'll work. Yes. So a thing like the Devils where you uh, already had some of the, like radical transformations with the Rock, now you have Lou Lamorello out bringing like Cheryl on and stuff like that. What's right. it been like to transform an organization from like a brand they've been really accustomed to and hasn't changed much to like, Yes. Thing? Yeah, Devils were a very old school hockey organization and and um, and very quickly we're trying to transform it into a business. And and part of that is you know we have an arena there. We don't we are we're tenants here at the at the uh, center down in South Philadelphia. Those of you who, who read the sports pages should chuckle. Um, and um, at the Prudential Center, it's a bigger business. I mean we have it's a, a top ten busiest building in America. Believe it or not, in Newark, New Jersey. So we spent a, quite a bit of time booking the building, trying to make sure that that's up and going. We walked in, there was like a hole in the roof. So it was like so it was not a um, it was not a world-class business when we can't got there. Um, Lou Lamorello, I've known him for 10 years, good friend. Um, you know, he's won three cups, hockey hall of famer. And um, he's getting a little bit on, I think he's, he's my dad's age, 72. So he, I think he was ready at that point, um, or thought he was ready a little earlier and Ray became available. So we went and got like a young, younger GM. And then Lou was, I think, felt like, I wasn't ready to give this up at that point. And then he decided to go to, he's in Toronto now, with the Maple Leafs. Um, I talked to him two days ago, um, and I wish him the best. It's just, it's, you know, we're on a mission there. Like, I, well, I, when I got there, I think there were 57 some odd staffers. We've got 230 some odd, 234 now. So there was no one left. I mean, they were literally like, it was like duct tape and string trying to hold that thing together. So, um, and, and you, that either energizes you or terrif terrifies you. And if it energizes you, those are the situations you run towards. If it terrifies you, you should never take that job. I don't mean me. I mean the whole the whole group. And so we, in six months, I think we added like 150 people. And so, so we've had like all kinds of growing pains. It's been a, been a tough slug. 
Um, I'd say Ray has been a breath of fresh air. Great partner, wonderful guy, good winning spirit, demeanor. John Hines is our young coach, youngest coach in the NHL. Um, we're, we're really, uh, he's 40 years old. He's got like a lot of like fire to him, competitive. And uh, he holds the guys accountable, which I think will be helpful given what we've inherited. Again, they're like older team, similar, like, similar to what we inherited on the basketball side. We got there, I think we had the oldest team in the league. I think last year we had 14 guys over 35 in a sport that's dominated by 27-year-old um, speed and skill guys. Um, so it's been a, been a tough, I think, tough transition, quite, quite frankly. So, um, so this year we, um, we took the medicine and uh, moved a lot of our older guys. And uh, we'll be young, young and fast. But we're still like probably two years away from a real team that can compete for an extended period of time. Yeah, 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 yeah. We're gonna do it. So it's all this. There's all these crazy rules, and like an old hockey organization won't mean anything to you if if you're not. But it's just like it's it's a different culture. It's it's a wonderful culture. It's just really different. And so they have all these crazy rules, and I'm like, why can't we have a third jersey? Because we've never had one. I don't know. Uh, yeah. So we're we're breaking down a lot of the old barriers and walls. We we literally had to like pull it together. And so we finally have a stable business. So now we're starting to have some fun. Yeah, you'll see another jersey. Don't tweet that though. Yes. Um, are you feeling, I know Prudential Center's only about 10 years old, I think. But with Eight. the Islanders moving to the Brooklyn Center and with Park the Rangers yeah. getting the brand new MSG, DC, mm -hmm. Prudential Center needing to be upgraded because I know it is used frequently. Yeah, so we're, we're eight years in. So eight years is relatively young for a building. Um, we've, we've, we've put in tens of millions of dollars so far just to make sure that it's up to par. Um, and we continue to invest in the building and we'll continue to. The move to Barclays Center is, <clears throat> is an interesting dynamic because um, just the way the league rules work, we could actually have blocked it. Um, but for us, it's like when they go to Barclays Center, it just knocks out 21 weekend dates which means if they have less opportunity for concerts, which means they come to us. So, <clears throat> so for us, it was good. It's a good outcome. Um, again, all friends, like the guy who runs MSG, Doc O'Connor is a dear friend. Brett Yormark, who runs Barclays Center, I worked with him before, a dear friend. So we, we kind of like half compete, half try to help each other. You know, if like if someone's trying to book a show at our place and we can't do it, we, you know, we shoot it over. We're just, you know, we're all trying to hustle and scrap and, and make a buck. Um, but I, I think at eight years, I think we've got a pretty good gem of a building. Um, the problem is it's the best kept secret in America. And I, I don't think that's healthy for business. Yes? The, the, uh, is the desperation of the Philadelphia fan base ever kind of have an effect on the front office? And if it does, how does our fan base kind of compare to other cities? Desperation. Um, we haven't seen it. So, um, you know, I can only speak to for honestly for the two years I've been here <clears throat> and I'd say on the Sixers end I won't speak for the other teams they, they have their own issues they can deal with them I'll just deal with my own um, I, I would say that um, you know you're always cognizant of what a fan base wants and how they're responding but I think some of the worst mistakes that have been made over time um, by fr any franchises outside Philadelphia or not have been in, in those that are you know in response to outcries by fans um, and, and look there's sometimes you just have the wrong guys running teams and that's that happens you know but for the most part you know you have to have the intestinal fortitude to, to make the right decisions and then stand by them and, and if you go back to like your CEO until you're not like it's that kind of mentality it's like you know like let the and in this case it's Sam the GM like in this case like let's let Sam build this team like that's his job and it's our job to help protect him and make sure that he has enough room that we don't have to make short-term decisions that'll come back and, and haunt us. And we, we have a couple of expressions, um, some of which you might not enjoy, but we always say, you know, if you want to go to the moon, you don't climb a ladder, right? Good one. Yeah, now they got it, just delay. The other one we say is, um, and you can use this one, um, we say, um, I always use this with my daughter, my 15-year-old daughter, who's like, in, for those of you um, women in here, like, I just hope you were nicer to your mother than my 15-year-old is to hers. Um, just a note. Just call your mother and tell you love her. Um, so I, I, that she, everything is just about instant gratification all the time with my 15-year-old. And I try to tell her, it's like, that's not how life works. It's like, 
you want to get better at something, you want to be good in math, study more. Go see your teacher. You want to be a good basketball player? Get in the gym. Shoot 100 shots a day. Like, it's just how life works. And it's like, and she just wants something now. And so oftentimes we say, um, you know, we're not picking apples. We're building an orchard, planting an orchard. It's like, it's a different mentality. Um, and I think oftentimes uh, media, both media and fans will influence decisions. Um, and, and I think it's our job to do what's best and try to explain the best we can um, how we're doing it, why we're doing it. But I, I said last year, it's like my neighbor's a big basketball fan. And like wherever you have these jobs, like your neighbors, your friends, your mom calls you. It's like, why did you do this? And you're like, oh, mom, you, you too. <laughs> Uh, like, mom, I just got you to see the Pope. Like, you got to back off. Um, it's hard. Like, I, I, you know, I mean, literally, it's like, why don't you get some more shooters like last year? I'm like, really? I hadn't noticed. I honestly had not looked out there and noticed that we can't knock a shot down. So it's like, I, that's what I wanted to say, but I can never say that publicly. But, but, um, but to my friends, I actually do say that. Um, so, so I would just say it, it is, it's, it's something that when you panic and go, you, I promise you, 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 it will cost you. Yes? So baseball has recently moved very strongly to advanced metrics. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of data has recently come online for the NDA. Do you see basketball, maybe even hockey, moving into a more use of advanced uh, data to evaluate players? I do. Yeah, we, I mean, we, we were just named like the most analytical team in sports by ESPN, I think, a couple months ago. So yeah, we, we, we were very invested in using data to gain an advantage. Um, uh, hockey is behind basketball. Um, and I, I think you actually have more opportunity in hockey. And we're trying to just, it's just an, a little bit more of an evolution. Um, and in basketball, it's more revolution. And it's just the way basketball people think. It's just like, okay, let's go. We can get an advantage. Let's go do it. Um, and so, uh, yeah, we're investing time, resources, money, bodies, and the kitchen sink. And we think there's a 2% edge you can get, and we want to take it. And so, uh, yeah, I think there's a, a huge opportunity for, for, um, for people in and around that, that space to make a real difference in sports. It's a whole different world. That's for sure. Yes. So, what's your opinion on you know how how would you say that balance problem maximization versus winning, and what's your take on that? Um, well, I mean, we want to win. I mean, we, obviously, like they're they're um you know they they work together pretty well. So, if we win, <laughs> we'll make more money. Um, <laughs> that's for sure. Um, in particular in hockey, when you get to the playoffs, it's, it's amazing. Um, so, but we spend time on both. I mean, it's, it's a business. You know, I work for, for two guys who, I work for oh, 13 guys, but the two um, managing general partners are both um, have made a living in private equity. So um, they are no strangers to a P&L or a cash flow statement. So we spend quite a bit of time focusing on, on how to optimize what we're doing. Um, our situation, just where we are now, we are investing quite a bit for the long term, and we run a decent business. It's not, not a bad business. Um, so I, I think you, they go hand in hand. It depends on the stage of development you are and the stage of development of your team. Um, but but the NBA is a really good. I mean, the NBA is a good business in general. Hockey's not as good a business. Football is a phenomenal business. Baseball is as good a business as you want it to be because of revenue sharing. And in football, TV deals. Yeah. Yes, they all do quite well. Joe will tell you more about that than I can. Um, in terms of revenue sharing, I, I think in a hard in, in a cap system, just the very nature of having a salary cap, just the basic economics, you have to have revenue sharing. It's just about the degree of revenue sharing. And how do you just make sure in that revenue sharing system that you provide enough incentives for those at the bottom to continue to invest in driving revenue? But you, you, you just, it's just economics. It's like you, you have a cap, high revenue teams, if you, everybody's increasing at 5%, the low revenue teams will be less profitable over time just because it works like that, it's just economics. So I, I think there's a place for it for sure. And there, there's like real arguments by really smart people that will, will tell you that, you know, it's, you know, I paid a billion dollars for my team. Like, why am I subsidizing somebody else? I, I've heard every argument. I've actually like did a lot of the analysis when I was at the NBA. 
when we went to a more aggressive revenue sharing plan. But, the, but, but just like the economics are the economics. You, we can ignore them. And that's what I kept saying. Like if you want to ignore the economics, that's, that's fine. But over time, you're going to have to solve the issue because you're partners. And, and you are somewhat defined by your weakest link in the, in the business of sports. Yes? With Adam Silver being uh, pro sports gambling, Me too. your partnership with uh, DraftKings, yeah. um, where do you see the future of sports? It, for, pros, gambling will be, in this country, within 10 years, you will be betting on sports from your seat. No question. There's too much money at stake. It's happening. No question. You already, do any of you play daily, daily fantasy? <laughs> it's like, yeah, yep, <laughs> yes. Have you ever been to Europe and you go to a soccer game? You go right, like they have the windows right in the right in the concourse. Like it's coming. It's no question. They just got to figure out how to the, the regulation part. And, and by the way, you know the reason you'd argue, and Adam does a much more eloquent job of explaining it than I do. But um, but if if you legalize gambling, you take a lot of um, what's wrong about gambling out of the system like you just there are algorithms that that can tell you when lines are moving too fast and for what reasons I mean there's, there's a lot of, of good that can come I think and then like think about like the changing landscape the media landscape so you're seeing like huge increases in uh, national media rights okay local media is going to start to depending on what happens with I don't want to get too technical but like you know if 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 television moves to a la carte and you're picking your own channels that you want to watch, and if you look at 25% of millennials um, not having any cable in their place where they live, I would say house, but no millennials have houses, um, you, you, you're moving towards a completely different model. So there has to be another pot of gold to sustain the increase in um, and the values of franchises and, and player salaries. I mean, it's, it's going to come from gambling, in my eyes. So it's, yes? Um, I wanted to know what are the pros and cons of being a tenant versus owning a building? I'd rather own a building. I cannot think of a potential pro having to ask for somebody else to serve my fans. It is absolutely the most frustrating, difficult thing. And, and Comcast um, Spectacle does a wonderful job. But I, I, I have to tell you, like, I, I want... At the Prudential Center, it's family, you know, we're, we hug. You know, here it's like, oh, will you, can I talk to your supervisor so you can, I mean, it's, it's, it's extremely difficult. I am a type A control freak, which makes it even more difficult. And how does that impact, um, or does it impact your relationships with uh, public policy makers? Yes, uh, we're much less um, focused here. Like I, I have a, I mean, I have a government affairs person full time, a senior guy. In New Jersey, and I'm, I, you know, we spend time with the governor and the governor's office and the mayor here. You know, it's it's a bit of an afterthought. I mean, we we don't we're not major players in the city, from from a government end. Um, we're working on something right now on the ticket tax that the state is looking to tax um, Philadelphia fans another eight percent if they come to uh, um, sports or entertainment events. To, I, I guess to the state somewhere, I have no idea. We're trying to block it, I, I, you know. I mean, there's a whole coalition of um, all sports organizations are, are, are working together throughout the state, but, but that's the one thing that, the one I've been here two years, it's the one thing I'm, that I've been involved with. In New Jersey, I've been involved with 35 of them. You know, so yeah, it's, it's quite a difference here versus there. Yes? Uh, can you explain the decision to move from PCOM to Camden? I'm just curious as to sure. what went into that, like the thought process behind it. Sure. So, um, so we, we practice at, at PCOM, which is a, I guess it's a medical college you know, on the main line. It's a, uh, on the Philly side though, of city line. It's, um, it's like, if you can think back, if you just close your eyes for a second and think about your junior high school gym. <laughs> and it's worse. So the only thing worse than the gym are our workout facilities. Um, so we, we have guys like literally like working out, like in the lobby out by the elevators. Like we just don't, it's just not built for an NBA team. So we knew, um, I guess I, you know, I, I came in August two years ago and I walked in, I'm like, this is not, this can't, you know, this can't be. And I, I called Josh and, and uh, Blitz and they were like, yeah, yeah, we're on it, we're on it. I was like, okay, this is not an NBA, this is not an NBA ready facility. 
Um, and Sam's focused on it. Brett's focused on it. You know, we, we need a, we need a place where you could be home. You know, where you want guys. It's not like again, you go back ten years. Guys are in for practicing out now. It's like they come in to shoot early. They have prehab done. Then they go through their stretching. I mean, these guys are there like six, seven hours now. It's not like in and out. So we, um, and then we looked at, we had a location, we're, we're housed at the Navy Yard, our offices. So we, we had a location uh, picked out there and then through New Jersey and the relationship, we started talking to the governor and, and they kept telling us that they had a pretty aggressive tax uh, incentive structure. And we looked at it and um, it was just the easiest decision we ever made. And we got $82 million of tax credits paid back over 10 years. So instead of building a $25 million facility, Philadelphia, we're building a, a 80 plus million dollar facility in Camden, 120,000 square feet. It'll be the state of the art, best practice facility ever. You know, so we're, we're pretty excited. We'll be able to put business and basketball together. It is a spectacular project. We actually have steel in the ground now. We're on um, on time and on budget. You know, which is very rare. And um, and I, I, I honestly was a, I, I called you know I called our mayor here a couple times and and he he didn't seem um, you know, motivated to see if we could work towards a deal. Um, he has other issues he was dealing with at the time here that he felt were more pressing. And I kept saying, like, all right, you know, let me know because we're going, you won't go. I'm like, all right, well, at some point, if someone hands you $80 million, um, and um, so that's the first reason. Uh, the second reason is, and it's like kind of how we live, uh, kind of our DNA here is about like how you can truly be a catalyst. And people kept telling me you can't be a catalyst in Canada. I'm like, I'm telling you, sports can change anywhere and anything. Um, if you look at what we're doing in, in Newark, and if you look at what we're doing in Philadelphia and, and the uh, and now in Camden, I mean, when you come to work for the Sixers, you give 76 hours of service to the community. Like, that's what you pledge. And so we shut down the office once a month, and we go serve. We go roll up our sleeves, and we go coach, mentor, teach, do beautification projects, um, work in homes. We do kind of whatever people are interested in and wanting to do. And we've got a really incredible um, mentoring teaching program that we're going to roll out in the next couple months, which we're really excited about, which will leverage basketball and education to help um, lift some kids out of need. And, um, and we spend quite a bit of time kind of in our DNA of our organization, figuring out how to get the most out of who we are and what we have to make this place better. And Camden needs the help. Like, they need it. And so the stuff we've done over there has been so enriching and enlightening. Um, our last thing we did was, um, oh, we ran, a, uh, we ran this camp, basketball camp. For 800 kids uh, in this incredible facility over there, Ray Kroc facility over there, and um, you know we gave them jersey, basketball. We did like health and wellness clinics, fed them, gave them a basketball camp. Just like it's like the basketball camp that kids with money would have, like these kids have. And at the end, the, the best part was like the punchline at the end: was 800 kids. We gave them each a, a pair of like the D Rose Adidas sneakers, like the nice sneakers, and the kids almost cried. Like it was so cool. So. You have these moments in time where you can actually go do little things for people. And then there are other opportunities for us, we think, in Canada to actually um, make some, some real fundamental structural changes in, in the way that school system and city operates. So, so, so far, so good. But more to come there. So we have time for one more question. Yes. So how does that uh, play in with um, the Sixers Foundation? Yeah. So uh, Sixers, we're um, we've got a ways to go. Um, we hired this incredible uh, director, executive director. Her name is Amy Heaver. Um, she we hired her from the um, Smithsonian. Before that, she was with Catholic Charities. She's an incredible woman, and um, and she's kind of um, kind of refocused our thinking and tried to center us on, on on separating our community relations, which is kind of like the business of serving. Like we do a lot of that. And, and then the foundation piece, which is like literally transformational, um, transcendent change with, um, with those that need it. And so our foundation, like, that's what we're doing. We're going into middle schools um, and we're gonna pilot one this fall. And we, and we think that there's a new way, like we're partnering up with some really like cutting edge um, educators to, to teach a different way. So we're excited, more to come on it, but we're excited to roll out kind of how we can actually, actually make a difference. It's fun, fun stuff. I, I tell you what, like, it is the one. You know, I, I was with this guy. His name is uh, Marty Ehrlichman, whose name won't ring any, won't ring a bell to you, but he manages um, Barbara Streisand. And I was in LA. He's, he's been managing her for 54 years. Been his manager, her manager. Isn't that amazing? 
So he's this older guy, of course. He's like 85 years old, 86 years old. So we're sitting in the Beverly Hills Hotel, this killer hotel. He's like a regular there. So he's got his regular spot, and they all know who he is. And we're chit-chatting. He's like, you know what the secret to life is? And I was just like, is this a trick question? I just met him. He's like, no, I'm serious. I'm like, yeah, no, I mean, I don't, but I'd love to hear it. I was like, do you mind if I film this? He's like, are you serious? I was like, yeah, I have kids. Like, if this is really going to be the secret of life, I'd like to share it with them, and I'd like to hear it from you. He's like, you're going to film me? I'm like, can you just tell me what it is? So I have my phone out, and I'm filming him. And he says, I actually have it on my phone. And so he says, like, he's, he says, listen, here it is. Here are two things. I was like, what? He's like, when you get up in the morning, put your feet on the ground, and you run towards work. He says, that's the first thing. I was like, I get that. Yeah. I, I said, that's, yes, I agree. That's really important. He said, second one. I'm like, what is it? He said, at night, you want to come home. It's pretty simple, right? And you're like, that doesn't mean anything to me. I was like, that was so powerful to me. It's like, think about it. Like, if you be passionate about what you do in the day and be passionate about going home and seeing your family at night. Like, that's it. I agree. He got it. Took him 86 years to figure that out. Only took me two minutes to film it. Thank you for your time very much. I appreciate it.